morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's very special program. Thank you all for your continued support. Since March 2020, we've produced nearly 150 live streams for you on the most compelling and timely issues, and we greatly appreciate your viewership and ongoing support. For those of you who would like to ask questions of our panel today, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of the screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, who is our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, which will start in about 25 or 30 minutes. I'm now delighted to introduce today's live stream. It's a very special Mother's Day tribute to mothers and mentors. We are pleased to welcome Robert Refkin, who will be talking about his very new book, No One Succeeds Alone, The Unexpected Lessons from the Mothers and Mentors Who Inspired Me. Robert Refkin is a husband, father, and the founder and CEO of Compass, a real estate technology company that is the largest independent brokerage in America. Also joining us is Ruth Refkin, Robert's mother. She has held many careers, though now works as an associate real estate broker at Compass. She is also the proud grandmother of three grandchildren. We are also thrilled to welcome two special guests, Michael Lewis, and high school student, Quinton Boone, from the Brotherhood Crusades Mentor and Me program. Brotherhood Crusade is a nonprofit social services organization in Los Angeles with a longstanding mission of making a difference in the lives of South Los Angeles youth. Our moderator is Deborah Hoteling. Deborah is the US Regional Communications Lead for the Ford Motor Company in Southern California. She is also a 10-year mentor at OC Grips, an anti-gang initiative created by the Orange County District Attorney's Office. It is now my great pleasure to welcome you here, Deborah, as our moderator. We're so glad to have you back partnering with us again, and we're looking forward to such a great discussion. Kim, thank you, and everyone, welcome. And a special thank you to Robert, who's going to be joining us momentarily. Robert. So glad hey to be you. here. Thank you. So glad to have you. And Ruth, thank you so much. I think this is so wonderful that we get to have um, an adult child and mother discussion today. So I think this is going to be just a ton of fun. So Robert, let's start with you. Um, give us your backstory. What prompted you to write your book? So uh, my mom was a single parent and it's just the two of us against the world. And she was actually disowned by her parents for having an interracial relationship with my father. And so it was really just the two of us. And uh, I was always looking for advice from everyone, trying to learn anything I could from people who had done it before, could help, help me understand how to make my dreams a reality, how I could help build a better life for the family I wanted to create. And that's really what this book is all about. It's a lot of you know, lessons from mentors that I've had in my life, whether it's people like the late Vernon Jordan or people like my mom. And in here, there are a lot of stories that will help remind people that whenever someone tells you you can't do something, you can't realize your dreams, that you can. Mm. And I want, first of all, we have to let everybody know, just in case if they are going to be Googling a little bit, that your book is on sale. I saw it on Amazon this morning, so I know that uh, it's uh, available for everybody. So we hope that you'll stay with us, but if you are going to wander anywhere, please go over to Google and take a look at his new book. And in your new book, you write about how you never believed that answers were inside. I love this. And that you always look for answers in the work of others. Tell us a little bit more about that journey. And so in the book, it's framed in what I call the eight entrepreneurship principles. 
And one of them is what we call learn from reality, which means that the greatest advantage you have in life is the speed at which you learn. So you have to learn fast. And how do you learn? Well, there are mentors uh, who are giving you advice from their experiences because they've been around, they've done it before. And that instilled in me this, you know, this viewpoint that the answers are everywhere around you. You don't need to make it up and reinvent the wheel. If you look to your left, you see people that have done it before. You can see companies that have done it before. You can see uh, their, their mentors that have advice. So I was just searching all around for the answers. There are customers that can tell you what they want. And when I was in high school, I was a disc jockey, uh, DJ. And uh, I noticed all my competitors were like playing the music they wanted to hear. And I just asked the, the people that hired me, what, what do you want to hear? and learning from them on their what they want and i just did it and it made me more successful uh at compass we serve over twenty thousand agents and they're all entrepreneurs and you know they're helping buyers and sellers every day uh and we just ask our agents what do you want and we have a tool called the feedback tool one of those important things that we've created where they put in their ideas of what they want they vote it up or down and we can crowdsource and just say these are the things that matter most to them uh, and you know, another example is I you know, ran 50 marathons, one in each state to raise a million dollars for nonprofits when I was in my 20s. And you know, the, the challenge is I, I wanted to give back to those nonprofits that helped me when I was younger. I was in seven nonprofits as a kid. And I was like, how am I gonna raise a million dollars? And I looked at all these bios of these, I called it like an automated mentor, a virtual mentor where their bios of all these people that have done so many wonderful things, whether you go to Henry Crown Fellows or White House Fellows or the World Economic uh, Forum you know, Fellows or Young Global Leaders. And I put all the bios in one document. And I, I put in yellow all the things that were like, interesting. I made that my aspirational bio. But in there, you know, I saw someone who ran 50 marathons in one in each state, someone who raised a million dollars by uh, climbing Mount McKinley and raised for AIDS, and someone who rode a bike cross country uh, with his mom. And, I, and then I put those ideas together and I said, that's how I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, run a marathon of one in East State uh, uh, to raise a million dollars for the nonprofits that helped me when I was younger and one that I, I, I had founded at the time. And my mom will come with me to all the marathons and we'll be able to spend time with each other. And did you, Ruth, did you go to all of them? Oh, you're, you're on mute, Mom. Thanks, guys. Uh, I missed only one because I was sick, but yeah, I went to all of them and it was a lot, experience of a lifetime to do that with my son. Oh my gosh, how did that feel for you? It, it was great. You know, um, 50 marathons in five years is a lot to do. And that meant that, that basically we went somewhere just about every month. And I was the travel agent. I booked it all, I, I organized, that was my role. And it got more and more difficult the further down the line because not every state has 50 marathons a year. A lot of them have one or two in small towns. So we end up in all these small towns in America and uh, there we'd be, you know, a white woman with her black son walking into towns that might not have seen people like us before, but welcomed us with open arms. And it was just an amazing journey. Uh, I started doing some of the 5Ks and 10Ks myself after a while. And uh, yeah, it was good for me too. So it, it was it was wonderful. Good for you. Oh. David called me to say he was going to do this. I went, really? <laughs> but yeah, really. You said you were on board. Absolutely. Uh, oh, I just I I love this, and I love the idea of um, talking about mentors here because what you're what you're discussing here. I think sometimes we think it's a little awkward to ask someone, "Can you please be my mentor?" But it sounds like you find that in all different ways. Some of it is asking some uh, someone to be a mentor, and some is through your aspirational bio of sort of culminating those character attributes or that um, that passion and sort of making it your own. Can you talk to us a little bit about the aspirational bio? I think there's a lot of we might be able to sort of steal that idea. I think in our own lives and careers. Yeah, I mean, look, that's all. I, I love it. If you can learn from reality from that, let's just take the learnings. We'll just pass them around. Let's keep on, keep it going around. Uh, yeah, the, the aspirational bio, 
the, the first principle of entrepreneurship uh, it called dream big, right? And because the dr your dreams are your cap to your potential. You're never going to be bigger than your dreams. And also dreams are what give you energy uh, and get in that they're your fuel to do incredible things. So, you know, part, part of the exercise of looking at all these bios was just how can I find more wonderful things to dream about? Uh, you know, the, what are all the wonderful things people have done that I, I never imagined? What I actually did is I put, I, I put all, all these bios into this one document and I highlighted in yellow things that I really liked that I kind of was already on a path to, to do or it was possible like I knew about it. And I highlighted in pink all the things I never even heard of. <laughs> uh, and then I put that into the aspirational bio because you can really just put it in one place like, wow, life is so exciting. And that gave me the, the energy to, to do some things that I would have never done otherwise. And you know, I think part of it, though, that I would recommend if, if you're going to do that is don't worry about not succeeding. <laughs> so many people are scared to dream because they're worried they're going to fail. Yeah, you know, shoot for the stars, land on the moon. That's great. The moon's fine. Uh, and yeah, you know, Wayne Gretzky says, "I never. I think it was like I never hit a. I never got a goal. Oh no, no, no I forget who said it, but I never, got, I never got a shot that I didn't that I didn't take. Just go take the shots. Mm -hmm. You miss one hundred percent of the shots you don't take. You miss. Yeah, you miss. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> now you know where I, why I like quotes so much. Yeah. <laughs> And you talked about dream big being one of your uh, core principles. Let me just run through them quick because I'd love for to get your reaction on this. Dream big, move fast, learn from reality, be solution driven, obsess about opportunity, collaborate without ego, maximize your strengths, and bounce back with passion. Uh, that's a lot to unpack. How? Tell us a little bit about your journey as you as you sort of honed in on those principles. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll walk through it and I'll tell you which one. Yeah, I'll, I'll walk through. So you dream big, that's the start. You got to start there. And of course, you have to move fast on your dreams, right? It's, it's a dream. You got to go for it. And now when you move fast, you know, where are you going to move? Well, learn from reality is the fastest way to know you're moving the right direction. Because if it worked for them, it worked for them, and that, and that company and that company, then you, you're you're more likely to succeed. And then, okay, you're gonna mess up. Something's on, so, this thing, or you're gonna have some some hiccups along the road. So we got to be solutions driven because it's not you know it's not always you know perfectly easy. Um, and then you have to obsess about the opportunity. Like you, you do that, get it, that's where you get your second burst of energy, right? Because because it's been you know you've been on a road for a while. You got to you got to obsess and you have to collaborate without ego you no one succeeds alone it's the title of this book right you, you just you 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 have to be able to get other people to push your your dreams forward and work together and, and make it a combined dream and then it's maximize your strengths which means um a lot of people go to sleep at night and they think about their weaknesses and their failures and what they're not good at i urge you to do the opposite uh, and, and think about your, you know, what, what, you, what you're great at and how you can do more of that. I got advice from Henry Cornell, uh, my boss, when I was at Goldman Sachs. He said, hey, Robert, you're never going to be great at the numbers. You're never going to be great at Excel modeling. Don't try to make that a strength. You know, minimize your, your weaknesses and maximize your strengths. That, that, I think, is one of the hardest. A lot of these other ones make a little more sense. I think they're e easier for people to adopt. I think the hardest one is really... Uh, maximize your strengths, just be what you're, you're great at, and surround yourself with people that can offset your weaknesses. Um, and then lastly, it's bounce back with passion. Now, first of all, if you're not failing, it means you're not dreaming big enough and you're not moving fast enough, right? So you, 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 you that, that is, a, if you're, you're, you should be forced to have failures and then you have to bounce back but with passion, with enthusiasm. How do you bounce back with passion? You got to dream big. Come with a whole nother dream. So it's like it's never ending fun cycle. I believe you all on all of that. But man, when you're failing, it feels bad, right? I mean, sitting in that moment, um, it, it, it's hard, right? How, 
how in that moment have you organized yourself to be able to to have that kind of um, discipline to bounce back or what would you how would you suggest for others to get that yeah so look i, I really think it's um, about the only way you can do is you can dream yourself out you know i you know, I, I saw my mom, you know, entrepreneur, uh, uh, you know, she go through bad relationships uh, with men, bad relationships with her family, of course. Uh, yeah, I, I never met my grandparents. Um, you know, I guess I'd go through bankruptcy, but she bounced back. And how, with this creative energy of like, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna like, and I, I said, you know, we applied for hundreds of scholarships at, uh, to college. We only got seven or so, but hey, we got those, right? Like. It, <laughs> You know, when, you know, I had a really bad heartbreak once um, or, and it took years to get over, but ultimately I wrote down the hunt, you know, I, one of the things that helped is I wrote down a hundred things I wanted to do in my life. Uh, and, and that, you know, and then I started checking off and started doing those things. It's like, it, you got to dream your way out of it. You know, I was a C student in school. And so I started dreaming about like, what can I do after school? <laughs> uh, and so I, I, I do, I do think that's the key. And Ruth, I'm looking at you because here's this young man who's got his list of a hundred things that he needs to do. And uh, how how do you lead a child like that to be to be this man that, that we're chatting with today? Tell us a little bit about parenting on that. Well, that's a big question. Um, so, you know, parenting a child like Robert is not easy because they don't just go along and do everything you say. They're always pushing back. They're always dreaming up crazy dreams. Um, my, my best advice is to let your kids dream and let them try stuff, let them mm -hmm. fail. Um, we, we're so careful for our kids. We, we don't let them experience life sometimes enough. Um, you have to affirm them. You have to believe in them. Um, I was a preschool teacher. That was my first career. And one of the things I learned as a teacher is just how many times a day a child hears the word no. Mm. No, don't do that. Watch out, careful, 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 don't do it, don't do it, right? Um, so we have to find the yes when we're raising kids. And you know, one of the things we used to say in teaching is find them doing something right. So rather than saying, you know, don't mess up, say, oh, I love the way you help me clean up, right? So you gotta just bolster the positive, minimize the negative, which is really what Robert's talking about. And um, kind of sometimes you just have to get out of their way and let them be themselves. You know, Robert mentioned he was a disc jockey. So your kid comes to you and he's 13 years old. He says he wants to take all the money he saved from work and from his bar mitzvah, wants to borrow money from you too, and he's going to buy equipment and he's going to become a disc jockey. 13 years old, of course, most parents would say no, right? And I did. I said no at first. And he's <laughs> relentless. This kid is was relentless. He's still relentless. Eventually, we compromised, and I let him do it within certain boundaries, and it changed his life. He would not be the man he is today if I did not let him become a disc jockey. So that's a lesson I try to convey to a lot of parents. Well, I can tell. Uh, Robert, that must your negotiating skills must have started um, in early years um, bartering with your mom on on making those things happen, right? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. No, like at the time I had dreadlocks, you know, down my back. I, I had a van that I painted red, yellow, green. I had my phone number on the side of it, although no one ever called the phone number. I, I was so surprised because it didn't have, and I had a heart next to the phone number as well. But <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, and. Uh, yeah, but I just, I, I think creating that business, I went through a nonprofit called the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, and they taught me how to create a, uh, uh, and this may go to your other question in, in a way, they taught me how to create a business plan. And really a business plan is effectively a dream on paper. They, you know, they mm -hmm. of course, which is kind of like, how do you bounce back? How do you make things happen? You got to create a dream one way or another, whether you call it a business plan, whether you call it, you know, yeah, you know, whatever it is, you got to put it on paper. You got to make it make it real that way. And there are a lot of you know things that you got to make happen. You know, I had to get my mom to say yes. I had to get my friends to hire me. And so basically, I had friends at all these different you know private schools and and, and public schools across the Bay Area, and I all got them to hire me because uh, they were on the dance committees. Uh, and then I told them, hey, I promise I'll play whatever songs you want. 
Uh, so just give me a list of 20 songs. I call it the Rude Boy Productions Guarantee because uh, the name of the, the DJ company was called Rude Boy Productions. And I was able to hire my friends and it was, it was a lot of fun. That, it seems like, I mean, looking back at my own life as well, those teenage, those early jobs, I still, I still pull from those. I still go back and go, remember when I was selling hamburgers? I, that's everything is salespersonship, right? There's so much that you learn as a teen about good business practices and what you have, how you have to show up. One idea that I really want, I can't um, not talk to you about is run hard to see where you're going. Mm -hmm. That that really, I've thought a lot about that since um, reading that in your book, and I would love you. I would love you to say more because we know that intellectually you got to move to understand what it is, but we have this tendency to sit. We want to think. We have to have a plan, but you're kind of going against the grain on that. Tell me more. Yeah, look, it's something that I I see people struggle a lot with, um, and there, there's a sentiment in in kind of the business literature uh, of fail fast, which means like your idea. Ideas don't, 99% of startups change their idea completely. <laughs> Compass was an idea over here, we completely pivoted. Um, and so the, the goal isn't just like come up with an idea, the goal is figure out the right idea as fast as possible by, by getting it out there, get out there. And so the point I, I was making about find, you know, run fast to figure out what you should, you know, your passion and what you should do. You know, I, I graduated college in two and a half years. Uh, I, you know, graduated business school in uh, a year and a half early. And, and I, I, I was working in the White House as a White House fellow at 25, which was like much younger than uh, my, my, than they, they usually did. And I did an internship on Wall Street after freshman year when the program called Sponsors for Educational Opportunity you know, really only let people do it after their, their sophomore or junior year. And so it's always like pushing to go faster, but it wasn't just like to go faster, just to go faster. Uh, maybe that's part of it, it's fun. <laughs> but, it, but it really was, I want to be my best self. I want to, I want to, I want to figure out like how can, how can I create that family that I've always dreamed of, right? And I want to have, you know, the three wonderful kids that I have today and my, my wonderful wife. And I want to, you know, eventually you know, buy a house for them. I, I, I had dreams, um, but I knew in school, the, re I, the reason I, I was a C student, I think, was it made no sense to me. Why am I learning about Western civilization? What does this have to do? What does calculus have to do with, with getting to where I want to go? And me and my mom, we'd argue about that a, a, a couple of times back then. I, I still don't understand it. <laughs> just because someone said a long time ago this is what you should do and then it gets on falling down and so I, I so I was running to say like what like I wanted to I wanted to test in the real world you know, I, I worked in McKinsey out of college and quite frankly I I failed I didn't get invited back okay went to business school year and a half so I got to get back out there worked at Lazard you know with, with the, the late Vernon Jordan and I did okay now, then I went to White House Fellows, and I realized, you know, the, you know, the, the, that, 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 that wasn't the passion that I thought it would be. I care more about local government and local politics than, than, you know, than, than, you know, White House politics. Um, and, uh, and then I worked at Goldman Sachs, and I, you know, I worked there for a number of years, but it wasn't my passion, and I, I wasn't really good at it. Uh, I knew my, my years were up at a certain point and I'd figure out another thing. Uh, and ultimately, you know, that led me to Compass. And, uh, and it led me to found a nonprofit called America Needs You, which serves students who are first in their families to go to college and below the poverty line. Uh, it's a mentorship organization where we, we or, we've organized thousands of mentors that help these, these students. Uh, now thousands of students over the years with career development, college support, two summer internships, and it's every other Saturday, these eight-hour blocks of mentoring, and uh, I loved it. It was like the first thing that I was truly great at other than the DJing, and I realized the, the reason I was so great at it is because my passion was, my passion is helping people who want to realize their potential 
do it to, and, mm -hmm. and to go for it. And that's why I'm, I was passionate about this book because this book hopefully will help people with a big dream realize it. And in the most unsuspected, expected way, I get the exact same feeling at Compass that I get through American Easier. Compass has, again, 20,000 entrepreneurs that are all agents. There are 2 million agents in the country. They're all entrepreneurs. They don't make a salary. They're, they're taking a bet on their, their talent, their creativity, and, and their hard work that they can build a business. It's their business. And I, I get the privilege of helping them realize their success and their entrepreneur potential. And, and so that, that's really the point, going as fast as possible to learn you know, really, you know, what you should be doing. And I can feel the energy. It's, it's coming through the screen. So I can see where that passion comes from. And I'm glad that you talked about students because we have a wonderful uh, opportunity today to be joined by Quentin Boone and Michael Lewis. If both of you would like to come on board and join the conversation. Hey guys. Hey, hey Michael. How are we doing? Here's Robert I, and Rudy. I, I want to, I just want to just tell you, Robert, your mother is a dynamic, amazing woman. After reading your book, it just really uh, connected me with my mother. Um, and so, uh, Ms. Repkin, just, you are a, an amazing woman and you've produced a, a dynamic young man as well. Thank you so much, but call me Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, yeah, one of the, the chapters of, of the book is every mother's an entrepreneur. I mean, what, what mothers do, I mean, you, you know, we all know, it's, like, it's, it's a miracle. Yeah. 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 Um, Quentin and Michael, I want to make sure that you, um, that you introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about um, the Brotherhood Crusade and how your friendship started. Um, Brotherhood Crusade has been in South Los Angeles now for 53, 54 years. Um, we, about 15, 16 years ago, we started uh, focusing on youth development um, and made it a priority in South Los Angeles. Um, we now service around 2,000 young people a year um, from disenfranchised areas of South Los Angeles um, that are high risk, um, that are high risk to join gangs. Um, and really just help them put them on a path of success. So, uh, you know, Robert, your book hits every point in what we do. Um, you talk about um, helping that young person care, right, initially, because they, we come in and they, they have challenges caring. Um, from there, we really, once we help them understand their identity and that they care, we get them to understand gratitude and appreciation. Um, and, and really, once they show their gratitude, and, and, and their appreciation, we're able to put them on a plan um, that meets those, those dreams, those big dream goals, right? Um, and so I, I, I read your book and then I did it uh, through audio books um, as well because I just wanted to kind of really get your perception of it. Um, and it was just right on point on the path that we um, are on at the Brotherhood Crusade. Um, our president and CEO, Sharice Berman Weaver, um, has really put a lot of uh, investment in our community, not only our young people, but the families. Um, and so uh, throughout COVID, so this last year, we've been working virtual. We haven't stopped working with our young people. We've been servicing them virtually, providing resources to them and their families, uh, laptops for school so they could work virtually, um, all those good things uh, to really help their success in life, right? Um, Quentin and I, uh, so I service several schools within LAUSD. Um, Augustus Hawkins High School is one of them. Um, and Quentin attended, he attends Augustus Hawkins High School. And I met him uh, when he and his mother, who was really involved in his life, um, was on campus. And we just struck a conversation. And she felt like Brotherhood Crusade was the right place for her son. Um, and he's been with us for about a year and a half now. And Quentin, I think we need to give a shout out to your mom because we know that she's in the audience here. And uh, it, it wouldn't be awful if you said Happy Mother's Day to her right now in front of everybody. So Happy Mother's uh, Day. Uh, and every other mom out there, Miss Refkin, you as well. 
And Quentin, you're you're studying for APs, and you've got a lot going on, right? Right. Correct. And and how is the mentor relationship with you and Michael? Um, tell us a little bit from your vantage point. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, first, I'll, I just want to thank you, uh, Robert, for uh, allowing us to space and opportunity. And about the uh, mentorship, it's very important to me because he teaches me like how to think about the why of things. I kind of think about why I'm doing it, not just what I'm doing, so I don't stumble on the way there. Uh, just to be intentional about doing things. He teaches me uh, why networking is important, not just what to do. Um, yeah. Football handling too. Right, and basketball. <laughs> and basketball. Yeah. I was I was sharing with Quentin, so I've been I've been training him. Uh, because they have a six game season because of COVID. And uh, I told them, I'm not, I'm not working, I'm not here for basketball. Um, I'm really here to build your self esteem, your self confidence, so that you could, uh, what you're doing on the court, you can use off the court. Um, basketball is, a, is just a tool to help him, you know, address his risk factor. That's all it is. And I see from the time we have the opportunity to open up this conversation to other folks who have joined us. Jessica? Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, we've got a lot of questions coming in, so I'll just jump right in here. Ruth, the first one is for you. Can you talk about how you developed resilience given your experience as a mom and the adversities you faced? How did you guide Robert around your circumstances and whether to overcome or succumb to others' opinions of your situation? Three-part question and a big one. Um, I'm an immigrant. I mean, came from a family of immigrants. <clears throat> I think resilience is in our DNA when you're an immigrant. Um, immigrants leave where they came from to go somewhere else to try, you know, they leave the safe to go to the unknown. Um, when I was a young adult, I moved from California, from New York to California, which is another form of immigration. So I really had to learn how to deal you know, a lot. And um, so I feel that I got that resilience growing up, actually. Remind me the other two parts of the question. So uh, how did you teach uh, Robert resilience or, you know, whether to succumb or to overcome the circumstances that he was dealing with? Okay, so we talk about wow. two things here. There's the, there's the um, general stuff that you have to teach kids growing up. And then you're talking about the, <clears throat> the special circumstances as well. Um, in terms of Robert being racially mixed, Jewish and black, I figured out pretty early on that what I wanted for him was to see the positives in both of that before he experienced the negatives. Um, there's so much negative that kids are fed when they are a minority. Um, I guess I wanted him to, before he learned about the Holocaust, before he learned about slavery, before he learned about all that, I want him to feel good about who he was and know that he came from two very strong cultures. We talk about resilience, two very re resilient backgrounds and to have pride in that because the bad stuff was gonna show up soon enough. So, so there was that, but also in terms of resilience, so I'm a tough love mother. And I was like, my answer to everything is work harder. You know, it's tougher, work harder. You know, it's like, it's, there's no easy answer. There's no easy answer to succeed in life. You have to just get off, brush yourself off and move on. And, you know, I, there I was a single mother. I had no money. His father was abusive. Uh, my parents had cut me off. Uh, I had to make it. You know, no mother, no single parent can choose not to do it. You have to do it. And so you get up and you do it every single day. You know, I've asked a lot what's the secret, my secret of parenting. It's the same as every other parent. I got up every morning, I made breakfast, I said, took him to school, I went to work, you know, every single day, you just have to show up. Thank you so much. And my mom started running half marathons when she retired, so I had to chase her around while she was doing her run. So um, <laughs> I, can, I can relate to you having a strong mom, Robert. Um, I actually want to turn it over to Quentin and see if he has a question that he would like to ask Robert. Okay, so my question for you is, um, right now I'm in the Brotherhood Group, I mean, sorry, I'm in the Brotherhood Crusade as well, but I'm in the Hidden Genius Project, 
which uh, teaches black male youth in technology and entrepreneurship. It's based in Oakland. And now I have an internship where I'm able to like kind of mentor my peers. And so I wanted to ask you, how would you use your uh, experience as a mentee to be a, a, be a better mentor? It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> What I've tried to do as a mentor is tell people what I think other people won't tell them. And so at a young age, I realized that feedback's a gift uh, and it's hard to receive, uh, but it's also actually, in most cases, harder for people to give you feedback than it is for you to, to deal with receiving it. And I realized that if you're you know, minority, you know, if you're an under, you know, if, if, if you're a minority of any kind, it's people are, are not, people are going to have even, it's even harder to get the feedback. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, what, what I, what I've tried to do is, you know, is one, help my mentees, like understand that like, you know, part of no, no one succeeds alone. It, it's not just like networking with people, and getting them you know, in the circle of like a mentorship is really like getting the best honest feedback, honest advice, the hard, like my mom mentioned, the, kind of, the, hard, the hard message, not just the nice one. Um, yeah, people have a, a lot of people will, will tell you like the nice, the easy things, but they won't tell you the hard things um, sometimes. Uh, not when you're messing up uh, and what you, what you need to do to fix it. Uh, and, and that you're, you're going the wrong direction. Yeah, uh, and so, you know, I'll just give you like one example. Like I, yeah, no one ever told me when I was younger that I would have to take care of my mom at some point, um, or that I would have to like what the expenses would be to take care of a family or kids. No one ever, no one told me that. Like I don't know how you can get. I was learning about Western civilization. I was learning about calculus. But no one ever told me like what it like what it actually it costs to take care of a family. And so when, when sometimes young kids will come to me um, and they'll say, hey, I want to go do this. I want to do that. And look, I want to be supportive of them always in their dreams. But I try to tell them things like, because I know not everyone's going to ask them this question. Do you need to take care of your parents one day? Like when they're older, well, you need to take care of them um, get, or, or not, because people are in different situations. So that, that's, that's something that I, I've tried from my time as a mentee. I've tried to be a, a different kind of mentor as a result. Thank you. Um, Michael, this question's for you. Can you talk about the importance of mentorship beyond high school when kids are entering the adult world and maybe need even more guidance? Yes, um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, we always say uh, when they leave high school, they are where they are, you know, um, and it's our job to uh, really help them independently navigate. So I look at it as if if, if I were to be in an airplane, parachute them out anywhere, they're able to um, understand the importance of learning, not just academically, but just from a broad standpoint of just being open to learn, right? Um, they're able to understand uh, their mental and physical uh, importance of, of what that looks like, being healthy, living a healthy lifestyle, being mentally free, right? Um, being able to uh, be in spaces where they have a sense of belonging um, and, and connection. Um, also being able to understand the importance of relationships and what relationships can do for you. Um, in Robert's book, he, he talks about kind of creating a domino effect in relationships, you know, meeting this person and then, you know, connecting with them and then meeting this other person. And, you know, every week you're kind of building up that network, right? Um, being able to, uh, I think this is really important, being able to um, understand the importance of agency and being an agent of your community, um, giving back to your community, um, being able to, uh, uh, we always say at Brotherhood Crusade, if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu, right? People are making decisions for you and about you. Uh, and so you need to be a part of that process, right? Having a sense of community. Um, and then ultimately, all putting all that together should should prepare you for work, either working for someone or working for yourself, right? Um, 
And if, if you, they're able to master those areas, we feel like after high school, um, they, they would be successful, right? They'd be able to uh, uh, engage in their community, have a family, understand the importance of raising your family, um, understand uh, the importance of uh, supporting your partner and what that looks like. I, I go back to Robert's book, his wife is amazing, um, and how she's really helped center him as, as a husband and as a man. Um, and so those are, those are all those important things that we do at Brotherhood Crusade to help our young people independently navigate in their community. Thank you. A uh, question for Robert. Now that the U.S. is reopening its economy and schools in particular, what advice would you offer a generation of students who may be lost or unmoored by the devastating impact of the pandemic? Look, that, that breaks my heart. Like it just, of all, of all the, there's so much you know, that, that has happened, but I worry deeply about a generation of, or a, 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 I, worry, I think we're gonna be dealing with the ramifications of uh, the lack of school for this period of time for so many people. Uh, for decades, I think 20 years now, 30 years now, we're going to be talking about this. Uh, and um, and so, like, what what advice would I have uh, for uh, you know if you're if you were the kind of student because of circumstance or school um, or a number of reasons that did that are now further behind. Um, the advice I'd have is one, stay positive. I, I believe deeply in positivity. Uh, I call it team positive. I'm on, I'm on team positive. Right? Like there's team negative everywhere. Social media, team negative. You know, press. There's a team negative. I'm not on team negative. I'm team positive because positive helps you move forward. It, it, it helps you, just, you know, get the right direction. Like, you got to stay positive um, first and foremost. Uh, secondly, uh, yeah, it's more, one thing to recognize like your school. School is important. I wish I was a better student in school, but it is not determinant for you know your, for you to realize your dreams. So, you, you know, so you're you're in a good place. And so if you're positive and you have you have your dreams, like and you, and you're willing to to work towards them, like you, things are still really good. So you know, keep that positive mindset. Um, uh, I, I I would you know I would get back into the school game as quickly as possible. Remember, you, there's there's the internet. You go to you can learn. You still learn so much in so many different ways and you know, tr try to get back ahead i would urge you because like it's when, when you're in a race and you're behind it's really hard to get back up just it just it's psychologically it's hard when you're in the front like you're actually you're just mentally you're going faster just because you're in the front and so i would try to maybe play some bets of like you know the school is in a number of different classes maybe like these three here you know you just can't get the momentum on but get these three and just really move move back into the front there to get that confidence and excitement back. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think I would just, I would just keep, keep pushing forward, but uh, it's, it's, it's a real issue. I'm like, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, a, a teacher, right? So I, I don't know how to solve the problem, but I, I do know if you dream big, you have a positive mindset, you're gonna push your work twice hard in the, in, in the area, in the places that matter the most, uh, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be able to get it done. Thank you so much. Um, Ruth, question for you. What is it like being a Compass agent and working with Robert? Well, Robert and I don't really work together. Um, we don't, we're not in the same building and that's by design. <clears throat> you know, when I first joined Compass, it was understood that there was gonna be kind of a separation. Uh, Robert was very sensitive when I joined that there not be any hint of favoritism, you know, the, the first deal he made with these, I get no referrals from Robert at all. You know, so we really keep it separate. Where I think I have added some value through the years uh, and compass for Robert is I am the agent which will give him the most honest feedback and probably more of it than he sometimes wants to hear. <laughs> but, um, you know, when, when we have a joke in our family that Robert sits down with me as if he wants to spend time with me and then he goes, so what tools are you using? <laughs> you know, and how's it going? So it's not family time, it's still compass time. Um, and, and we discussed, I think a lot of changes have happened and improvements because, of, you know, I was an agent way before compass was started. So I'd already had a, a, a lot of experience being an agent. And as you'll read in the book, um, 
was really my dissatisfaction with other agencies and what they did not give me as an agent that kind of fueled some of the things that Robert created in Compass because he wanted to create a company in which agents like me could be successful and supported. So I love that part. Thank you. And on that topic of real estate, Robert, uh, we have a question. Why is the real estate market so hot right now? Yeah, yeah the people, I, I think there's a permanent shift in demand for homes. I don't think it's temporary. I think it's it, it's going to be permanent. And home has never mattered more. People want more indoor space because of COVID. They want more outdoor space. They want more private office space. They want more second home space. Uh, it's in a way been a like multi-billion dollar free advertising campaign to every person in the country saying, have you really thought about how important the home is? <laughs> right? Have you and, and and everything that you need. And when people couldn't dream about a lot of other things, um, they they were stuck in their homes. They're like they're dreaming about how to make their home better, uh, or maybe this isn't the right home, maybe it's another home. And so I think that that's why there's you know why things are so hot on the demand side and supply. There's just this this country doesn't have enough homes to meet the demand, uh, and so there's low inventory at historic levels, and uh, and so that's that's why it's so hot. But I do not believe it's going away. Aside from your mom, what person inspired you the most to succeed in life and give back to society? It would be Vernon Jordan. Uh, Vernon Jordan, unfortunately, he passed away earlier this year. He was a civil rights leader. Uh, he was Bill Clinton's best friend and head of his transition committee uh, when Bill Clinton became president. He was a partner at, uh, at a Aiken Gump law firm and a senior partner. Uh, at Lazard, where I had worked, and you know, I, I feel I feel I feel guilty about how much exposure I had to him. He invited me to his Thanksgivings. Uh, I was able to you know talk to him. You know, in, 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 he was the only other black person at, at Lazard when I first started, and so I was able to spend a lot of time with him. And you know, he gave me advice. Like, yeah, you know, I told him when I wanted to start and I came in, I'm 22 or 23 and I'm like, Hey, I want to do this for two years. And I want to start a nonprofit. And he's like, son, you got to make a check before you write one. <laughs> right. And regardless whether he's right or wrong, he's just he's seeing this person, like give me advice. And he'd always tell, he said, I told him, well, I, I want to do this. I want to do that. He's like, it's, it's not a revolving. He said, he said, you have to be an institute. He said, don't leave an institution until you are one. And uh, it's not a revolving door. And like, it just, and I never had a father figure, so I always wanted one. And like, and that's really, I think that's how the whole mentorship thing happened. I was always, it, it was very more personal and emotional. I imagine more like you know, Quentin and, and, and Michael. That's how it just, just it, this is a, per, it's a personal thing. You want, you want that feeling. Um, like, you know, someone, someone cares and they can, they can help. It's, it's, it's very meaningful. Uh, but yeah, he in, introduced me to a number of, incredible black leaders and uh, that helped me he's the one who told me to apply to be a white house fellow and and there's a difference between a, a mentor and a sponsor a mentor gives you advice a sponsor loses you uses their political capital uh to help you and so he he was more than a mentor he was a sponsor and i'm just i i, I and i also think i mean i learned it from many people but it's reinforced with him that you're only here because I'm only here because people worked hard and paved the way be, before me. If it wasn't for Vernon Jordan, I, I mean, so many people wouldn't be here. He was like, so many black leaders today would not be where they are if it wasn't for him. He was on more Fortune 500 boards than anyone in the history of the United States, and he did a lot with that. Um, and uh, and so you're only here. I'm only here because people worked hard and paved the way to make this happen. Um, to create the opportunities. And it's my responsibility to work hard, be successful, be a role model, and help pave the way for others. Uh, and that's a great source of energy. Uh, that, that's a, and, and so he really helped reinforce that. But I, I learned it through all my nonprofits. I'm sure, Quentin, you, you have that same. You know, mom, I was in seven nonprofits as a, as, a, as a kid, and they all have some form of that, which is great. It makes you feel like when you don't belong, it has, hey, you know, you do belong. You're part of something greater. And so is a, a great way to turn everything into positive. 
Thank you so much. Quentin, I'm gonna come back to you. Uh, can you share with us some of the lessons you have learned both from your mom and also from your mentor, Michael? First off, from uh, Mr. Lewis, I would say to bring value to any space, um, whether it's helping out setting up chairs, whether it's bringing advice, uh, bringing energy to any space, just bring me some type of value. Uh, the mm -hmm. second is to find my purpose. You know, two people might want to get to the same destination, but for different reasons. So they have to take two different routes. Um, just my route is like one of one. I feel like um, just having to individualize my plan. Um, yeah, individualize my plan and just know why I'm doing certain things. And as far as my mom, I'll say definitely uh, be nice to people, even when they're not nice to you. Uh, I've seen her do it a lot more times than I would have. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's important to just like keep a cool head. Um, not necessarily like, not necessarily for that person, but for yourself, just to calm down and, you know, be rational. Very cool. Thank you so much. Um, a question for Ruth. Besides your remarkable, accomplished son, do you have persons who have inspired you in your journey as mother and breadwinner for your family? Well, I've been inspired by all the mothers around me, that's for sure. And happy Mother's Day to all moms out there. Um, you know, I want to talk to Michael for a second, because, Michael, you're exactly the guy I would have made sure Robert met yeah. when he was in high school. Uh -huh. And I am incredibly grateful for all of Robert's mentors. All Whenever anybody took an interest in my son and mm -hmm. was willing to help him in any way, I was extremely grateful and I let them know that, mm -hmm. you know, and meant very often they became part of our lives and I'd invite them to dinner or whatever. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm just grateful for everybody who helped him along the way. Mr. Jordan invited me to Thanksgiving along with Robert and how honored I was to be there. Um, but also, you know, in terms of the resilience of working hard. I mean, I, my father was quite a man, even though he, there was a lot wrong there. And like, as Robert mentioned, he cut us off and all that. He was a hardworking guy. He had no education. He was the 13th son of an ultra Orthodox family in the old city of Jerusalem. And he reinvented himself, became an immigrant, came to America, ended up leaving a whole lot of money, not to me, but, you know, to, to the other side of the family. And, um, you know, it's just amazing what can be done when you just put your mind to it. So I think I learned, in spite of all my rebelliousness, I learned a lot of lessons from him. And I just learned that he was the 13th kid in an Orthodox family. I didn't, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> it was time talking about him, so that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, well, I know this but also, Robert, I know you're going to agree with this. Let's uh, send Quentin a signed copy of your book. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look, I, I want to second what, what my mom said. Um, yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the mentors, I mean, thank, thank you so much for what you're, you're doing with your organization. Um, it's, the, it's the best of this country. Um, and it means so much. Like when you're, when it, I, I, I remember being, all those moments, just somebody just taking an interest and in, in believing in you, caring. It's not that many people do, like when you're, you're, you're out there and you got you, your mom, and you know, the teachers may not always, you know, yeah, you may not always vibe with them, and you have your friends, and there's a pressure all there, and then there's like this give you one person and you know, caring and really wanting to help someone, it, it, it could change their life. And I'm sure you, it's, it's your, you do it all the time, but I just want to I want to thank you on behalf of you know, the country we live in for 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 what you do yeah. i'd like to, i'd like to make one more comment on that if i may you know I, I think of it as ripples in the pond you know you throw in a stone falls in you don't even know what the ripples are going to be down the road mm -hmm. so somebody who mentored robert you know 30 years ago and now robert is mentoring others and creating an organization full of people and helping them succeed so you don't know the effects of your actions at the time. But I love it, Robert. I haven't heard you use the phrase team positive before, and I love it. I love it. Um, 
because that's the thing. all you have to do is give a positive shot to somebody once, just once. Yeah. You know how you can walk past somebody on the street and you give them a smile and all of a sudden they smile? I mean, maybe they were looking down. You know, you never know. A little shot of positivity can have effects that you will never see, sure. but they can be monumental. Thank you. Um, I think this will probably be our final question, and this might actually go both to Michael and to Robert. Can you elaborate about the balance between helping someone just enough to motivate him or her, but not so much that it feels like giving them crutches forever and not allowing them to become independent? Michael, how about you go first? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? And so um, I, I, I say this to our team all the time. We're in the business of saving lives. Um, we get people at their most vulnerable point in their lives, right? The, the trauma that they've endured, um, the, the environmental norms that they live, and, and we have to address that unaddressed trauma. We have to change that mindset so that they self-actualize, right? Um, and then re-engage them in school, right? Um, and I, I, I've, I've always tried to kind of create my space um, from them to develop them. Like I said, I, I want them to be able to independently navigate. That's my goal for them. And so, um, being able to, um, you know, model what I want them to see, what, what I want them to do, being able to um, kind of do it together with them and then let them practice away from me um, and then kind of take on that lifestyle, take on that habit is, is what we try to do at Brotherhood Crusade. Um, we say it takes about 894 hours to be able to really effectuate change in someone. But the majority of that time, they're doing it away from me, right? They're practicing greeting and asking meaningful questions. They're, um, they're understanding the importance of, of shaking hands. Um, they are uh, really trying to, uh, like, you know, like Robert's done 10,000 times, writing thank you letters, right? Handwritten thank you letters. You know, those simple things that um, can help catapult them, not only um, from a network standpoint, but from a self-esteem standpoint, right? We're trying to help them feel better about who they are. Um, and so I think, I think that uh, the process that we take um, is critical. So that's, that's a great question that you ask. Um, and I, I feel like um, it takes time. You gotta be patient, right? You've gotta give a little, uh, um, uh, a little Miss Ruth and, and kind of kick them in the butt a little bit. Um, but you're doing everything in the most loving way, uh, the most loving and caring way and compassionate way. Um, we're human centered design. So, um, you know, we do everything with empathy so that they can really maximize that goal. Yeah, I, I, I second all that. It is a good question. Um, I, I think that it's important to, I think that in the world we live in, I'd rather take risk of, you know, a world where people are helping people more and, and you know, going a little further on helping uh, and then helping less. I think on balance, I would say like, you know, let's, let's just keep on helping each other as a community. And I wouldn't worry too much about, are you helping someone too much and not letting them kind of go off and do their own thing. I think the, the risk of that is, isn't as great as the, the alternative risk. Uh, but I do think, but I do think it's it's a good question, and it's important to keep people accountable, right? Because you only have so much time in a day, and so you want to give your your time to the people that are that are you know, taking the advice and going off and running with it. Uh, and I'm gonna just close by saying, you know, for mentees, like one of the, you know, if you're, if you're out there right now and you want to realize your dreams and you're looking for mentors, one of the easiest ways to develop a strong mentorship relationship. And it's so simple. It's literally just do what you say you're gonna do. <laughs> it just, uh, so many people aren't doing what they say they're gonna do. It doesn't have to be heroic things. You don't have to like overshoot. Yeah. It's just, you know, follow up, you know, with a handwritten note, say, thank you for the advice. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm gonna use it. Then let them know a month later, hey, I took that advice. Here's how it worked or didn't work. Yeah, but th and thank you for that. 
A month later, hey, can we get together again? You know, you gave me advice in the past that I took. I'd love to talk to you again. You do that with it. You find somebody and you do that thing, <laughs> then they're going to be with you for that. Then that, that then they're going to be with you forever because everyone just wants to feel valuable and feel a part of a community. They want they want to feel like they're helping. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think that the, the accountability and just doing what you're saying we're going to do, it's so it's so important and so, it makes it so easy to develop a strong mentorship relationship. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for uh, this Q&A portion. And Deborah, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, Kim, do you have a few last words for us? Sorry about that. <laughs> I just wanted to thank all of you. Deborah, thank you so much for moderating. Robert and Ruth, what, what an inspirational, wonderful story. And Michael and Clinton, we're so glad that you could share more about what's going on with the Brotherhood Crusade. I love that organization. It's, it's the best. So thank you so much for your expertise. Thank you for your time. And we'll have to have you all back because this is an ongoing story, right? Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Michael, Thank Quentin, you. Deborah.